first, but I'll just ask you guys before we get started, um, uh, you know, what the process you went through in the Senate committee was that you kind of present as you did yesterday to the... To yeah, so we had, you know, less time today than yeah. them than we did yesterday, so we gave them a, a pared down yeah. uh, presentation. Um, but they didn't have slides or a screen, so we printed the slides out and okay. went through them All right. manually. Yeah. And we're happy to, to spend our time with, with you all however you would like, needless to say. You've received the initial presentation, so we don't want to do that again. Yeah. Um, we could go through um, the report sort of section by section to give you an orientation to this behemoth if you would like. Yeah. Or we could simply just continue the dialogue, yeah. answering your questions um, or so, taking any other direction. Yeah, that's actually not a bad idea, just as a warm up exercise for us. Um, and I don't want to take a lot of time doing yeah. it, but seeing we have an hour with you, mm -hmm. if um, uh, I, I actually think that would be helpful. I, 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 I did not make it through the entire report last night. I kind of comped out uh, about two hours past my bedtime. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm impressed that you don't do it at all. Uh, that actually would be helpful, I think. If, okay. If, you know, kind of the first 10 minutes of your presentation, if you just kind of touched on each section of the report, mm -hmm. uh, I think I got through about page 60. So, um, I don't know what section that is, but section four maybe. Yep. Um, but uh, that would be helpful if you just quickly touched on each section. Um, I was kind of personally, I was writing questions as I was going Great. along, kind of in the margin, and so I've got a few questions, as I'm sure others do as well. So then, why don't we take um, why don't we take ten or fifteen minutes for you guys to do that? Great. You know, again, using the report as an outline, and then let's use you know our last uh, kind of 45, 50 minutes just for questions around the table. And it'll be somewhat conversational. Um, before we start, I'll just let you know, and this is typically how most hearings uh, 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 committees run. Um, I'll just call on people as they have questions. Um, and then um, what we'd ask you to do is to, um, our, our hearings are recorded. Um, so if you can identify yourself for the record, just so the record knows your voice and who you are, and then, um, We'll, we'll go from there. So that's, that's great. Good. Yeah. Should we start there? Yeah, let's go ahead. Just identify yourself. All right. Uh, I'm Mark Hapstead. Uh, I'm a fellow at Resources of the Future, and I'm the director of our Carbon Pricing Initiative. And my name is Wesley Look. I am Senior Research Associate at Resources for the Future, uh, and Mark's colleague on this project. Pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, yeah, we'll literally just walk this through step by step. So it starts with these key findings on page one. Um, these really are just our sort of most digested, what we think most policy relevant takeaways from the report. Um, we talked about a lot of this stuff yesterday. Um, the upshots in general, right, are that Vermont's emissions have been increasing since 2011. Um, Vermont is unlikely to its meet its emissions targets with carbon pricing alone. It's, well, first of all, unlikely to meet its emissions targets without some kind of new policy. Um, carbon pricing alone is not likely to achieve the emissions targets. Combining moderate carbon pricing and non-pricing policies um, could achieve some of the state's targets. Um, and then we talk about a number of uh, sort of economic outcomes of carbon pricing. Um, the revenue recycling matters a lot in terms of distributional equity, how low-income households are, are impacted, um, et cetera. So there's key findings. Then we do an executive summary. Um, and you know, this summarizes the report. Uh, that's about 10 pages. <coughs> um, I'm going to sort of skip over these two first pieces because we will be talking about each of what they are discussing as we go through the section. So then on page 12, you just have the introduction. Um, you know, this essentially sets the stage for this study, which, as you all know, was um, requested by the legislature last year. Um, we responded to an RFP from the JFO um, and were selected to do the analysis. Um, uh, though that the, the study itself came from recommendations from the Vermont Climate Action Commission, the governor's uh, 
Climate Action Commission, which was created in 2017. Um, we, one of our sort of high level messages that we want to convey to you all is that in this report, we're not trying to provide recommendations. We said this yesterday, and we just want to kind of underscore that. Um, we are just trying to provide you all with the best information that we can to inform your decision-making process, your civic deliberation process, your engagement with, with your constituents, et cetera. Um, but we're not sort of saying this is what you should do. Um, so that's part of what's in the introduction. Um, section two, which starts on page 13, <coughs> is entitled The Vermont Context. And in this section, we talk about, we start by talking about general economic and environmental trends. Um, <clears throat> you can see that the state's economy has been growing, um, but along with state um, emissions. Um, on page 14, you see the graph that we showed yesterday, um, which is this increasing trajectory. So this is page 14 um, of emissions, and that that trajectory um, is headed north when emissions reductions need, or the emissions targets in the state need emissions to be headed south. Um, we then talk about, as we discussed yesterday, the share of Vermont emissions by sector. Um, <clears throat> I'll just say, long story short, the lion's share of the emissions are in the transportation sector and in residential and commercial home heating and fuel use. Um, well, resident, uh, home and business heating and uh, uh, fuel use. Can we just insert a quick question? Yes, a clarifying question. Uh, can you tell me the difference between industrial fuel use and industrial processes? Yes, so industrial fuel use is um, literally the consumption of, of fossil fuels primarily in, in, in this um, model. So, you know, um, diesel, uh, gasoline, mm -hmm. any fossil fuel, kerosene. You know, in some cases, bunker fuel or hog fuel, um, but primarily diesel and gasoline. And, and in other parts of the US economy, coal would be in that category. And then process emissions are sort of non-energy related, or emissions not related to the consumption of energy. So a good example of a process emission would be in the process of producing cement, um, just the chemical process. Um, the clinker, I forget exactly the details, but in the, in the creation of clinker, which is an ingredient in cement, CO2 emissions are released. It has nothing to do with energy consumption. Okay. It's an independent chemical process that um, is required in making cement that produces greenhouse gas emissions. Process emissions, sometimes, although technically this would be referred to as fugitive emissions, but um, um, can be associated with energy, and that's like leaking methane through leaky pipes and whatnot. So the, the methane is actually in the fossil fuel industry, so zero percent, but um, yeah. the fossil fuel industry number here is actually uh, methane emissions associated with trans trans uh, emission and distribution of uh, natural gas. And um, the other thing that in the industrial processes emissions here is um, Greenhouse gas emissions associated with superconducting uh, manufacturing. Okay, thank you. What is that? Superconductor manufacturing. Oh, superconductor. Thank you. Plastics. Uh, computer parts. No, no, no. What I'm asking is, um, is, is, is plastics? Would plastics be a, another example of industrial processes? Sorry, there's my question. I actually don't know the plastic plastics industry in that detailed way. Um, a lot of the plastics it uses um, uses like uh, oil, uh, but doesn't actually burn the oil. It, it's a component into the plastic, right. and so that's not actually an, an emission. But to the extent that they were uh, burning the oil as well, that would be in the industrial fuel use. Okay. So on page 16, just moving along, um, I think. What we want to convey here is that the state of Vermont has a number of different emissions reduction targets, greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets. There are four that we talk about in this report. <clears throat> um, and sort of the emphasis throughout is placed on the first two. So those four are the statutory targets, um, the targets that are associated with the US Climate Alliance, which map to the 
Paris targets that the Obama administration put forward, the nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement, that the Obama administration is basically um, the U.S. emissions reduction target. Um, however, the Trump administration is um, pledged to withdraw the United States from the Paris Agreement. So um, that's why the U.S. Climate Alliance arose, states saying we are still in, we are still committed to this global cause of addressing climate change. That's that target. Um, under two MOU is also part of that response. Um, and then the NEGECP target. But we focus on the statutory target and the U.S. Climate Alliance target. We normalize. So the way targets, just to pause for a moment, because I want to recognize that perhaps not everyone is familiar with this, but stop me if you are. The way targets function, you have three important numbers. One is your base year that you're comparing against. So if you're comparing against 1990 levels as a common base year, or 2005 as a common base year, so that's what you're comparing against. And then is your target reduction. So we want to reduce emissions below that base year level. So we would say we want to reduce emissions 27% below 2005 levels. Um, and then your third number is your target year. So by year X, we want to achieve that emissions reduction. To sum that up, for example, the U.S. Climate Alliance target is by, um, against a 2005 base year, we're going to reduce emissions by 26 to 28 percent by the year 2025. Um, <clears throat> so we've got um, four targets here. We, we try to normalize them all to 2005 levels for ease of comparison, um, which is the the fifth column um, to the right in that table. We then talk about some existing state actions. This is what the state is already doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into the details on that, and you all are probably more familiar with that list than we are. Um, section 3, which begins on page 21, is where we, we discuss non-pricing policy options. So the non-pricing policy options is a very broad group or category of policies. It includes things like EV purchase incentives, so um, similar to what Green Mountain Power has had recently, or various electric utilities have in the state, for buying down the cost of electric vehicles for consumers. If we reduce the notion there, is if we reduce that, that sticker price, consumers are going to be more likely to buy that car, which is itself one of the most powerful ways to reduce emissions in the state. Um, so that's an EV purchase incentive that would require a public expenditure, um, or if it's, it could be structured through the utility where ratepayers are subsidizing it. There are various ways of doing it, but um, that's one example of a non-pricing policy. Um, another example would be <clears throat> public investment in weatherization programs. So low-income weatherization um, we've understood as a priority in the state, so further advancing that work. And then sort of incentives to purchase various energy efficient or clean technologies like advanced wood heat or um, um, electric heat pumps as, as heating um, sources. In addition to those kinds of technology focused incentive policies, non-pricing policies includes regulatory programs. So the primary regulatory program that we look at is increasing the stringency of the state's existing renewable energy standard. So um, for those who aren't familiar, the renewable energy standard sets a, a target currently that by the year 2032, 75% of um, Vermont's electricity will come from tier one renewable energy sources. And there's there are three tiers. If you don't want to go into the RES right now, I assume. But we, we estimate increasing the stringency to 100% by the year 2030. So that's an example, another example of a non-pricing policy. We, an important caveat on our work related to non-pricing policies, which is articulated in here, is that our contract with JFO included nothing on non-pricing policies. So we do a sort of broad brush treatment of it because we felt as though we heard, we heard directly from um, elected members when we were here in September at the beginning of this project and the public that, that non-pricing policies are an important part of the Vermont picture going forward. And so we need to look at it in some way. We've relied heavily on the research of others, primarily state agencies um, in Vermont, um, that have, have done their own independent estimates of the emissions reductions associated with those non-pricing policies. 
we've wrapped that in, but it doesn't get incorporated into our model. Um, it's sort of the best we can do, and in some respects beyond the call of duty, but we felt like it's going to give you all the most comprehensive picture um, of the different levers you have to work with to draw down on emissions. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's go on to, I'll, let me just flag briefly um, that we also <clears throat> did this kind of side analysis in the non-pricing policies of uh, electric vehicle purchase incentives. Uh, one of our colleagues at Resource for the Future is a specialist in this area, so he modeled a Vermont EV purchase incentive. And we, we speak to it very briefly in here, but if it's something that you're interested in, we go into detail on that policy in Appendix A. We kind of, we didn't want to take up too much time in the body of the report that's already very long, um, but we think that the, there's potentially a significant value out there. And further research could be done in that area. So section four, I'm gonna pass it to Mark here, which starts on page 29 is where we go into carbon pricing policy options, which again is what we were really contracted to study primarily and is what we emphasize in the report that we're. Um, so section four uh, just starts with uh, the theory behind carbon pricing to give just some background on, on um, kind of the economics behind the theory and, and the, the using the price as an incentive to uh, um, <laughs> change behavior when the behavior is associated with a negative externality. So um, so there's a page or two of uh, discussing that. Um, next we go through kind of the key dimensions of a carbon pricing policy design. We went through this a little bit yesterday. But kind of the when you're setting a carbon pricing policy design, you know, you have to, you want to do a carbon tax or you want to do a cap and trade. But really, I th the, it comes, there's a lot more kind of dimensions that are involved. And the first dimension is if you're doing a tax, what is the price path? Or if you're doing a cap, what is the cap? And so this price path or cap level is, is obviously one of the very important um, uh, design decisions. And then as we flagged yesterday, what you do with the revenue, we call it revenue recycling in economic speak. Uh, the revenue use um, is very important. We went through that yesterday. Uh, and obviously also what kind of sectors you cover uh, is important. You know, don't have to design a policy to cover all emissions. You could target certain subsectors, and and so that's that's a potential um, source of variation across different policies. And then there's like the geographic or regional scope. Regi Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is covers emissions in ten states. British Columbia Carbon Tax just covers just emissions in British Columbia. And so there's different ways. Uh, so you could look at a Vermont only policy, or you could look at policies that cover uh, emissions uh, beyond just Vermont. And so um, we kind of go through, so that's kind of just the general description of that. And then uh, the next section is really um, going to tell you how we're going to evaluate these carbon pricing options. Um, the model descriptions are, are very, very brief here, but Appendix B uh, does include a little bit uh, more model description. And if you want way more model description than you could possibly handle, mm -hmm. There's 100 pages of appendix in the back of this book that explains a very similar economic model to the one that we used to analyze here. And so this is the, the gory, gory detailed 100 pages of appendix and equations uh, if you're interested in that. <laughs> um, that little book has a hundred page appendix? Yes. <laughs> no, that appendix has a little bit of appendix. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is the appendix. <laughs> okay. Thin pages. Yes. Um, so when we want to evaluate carbon pricing options, we want to look or we want to look at both the environmental and economic impacts of those policies. So we want to look at the costs and the benefits. And so to do that, we're going to look at a, a lot of different dimensions. And so for each policy design, we're going to look at how those different policy designs affect these different metrics. And so those metrics that we, look, we evaluate are obvious one is greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the policy is designed to reduce those, and so I think that's the first thing we should look at. We also want to look at uh, what we call leakage, which is the change in emissions in neighboring states. So that's so we look at both the change in emissions in Vermont, but also the change in emissions in, in the neighboring states. 
Uh, and then, as we mentioned yesterday, uh, criteria air pollutants are associated with burning of fossil fuels. And as you uh, reduce fossil fuel use through uh, a carbon pricing mechanism, you will also reduce uh, some of these local uh, pollutants. And so we quantify those, uh, both in just kind of the percent change, and then we try to monetize using some EPA estimates, monetize the value of those reduced emissions. And then kind of going through the, those are kind of the environmental impacts we're looking at, but we're also obviously interested in the economic impacts. And so we go through the, the carbon revenues, how much revenues is, 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 um, is raised, the macroeconomic impacts, what happens to say GDP, what happens to output by industry. Yeah, just a, yeah. So it's a, data, it's, a, it's a data question, and I heard you yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, talking about um, the differences between more rural Vermont. Yep. Um, and, I, and I think we have a lot of average data here. Yes. So in Vermont, with our economy, um, the Chittenden County economy is growing. Rural Vermont's economy is declining. And so what my question is, <clears throat> is if there is a way, if there are key places that you think it would be important for us to try and pull things up. Part so that we better understood the impacts. Okay. Does that do you understand what I'm asking? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I do understand what you're asking. Uh, one thing you could you could think about is these would be I would call back of the envelope calculations, um, but we do show the change in in um, output by sector and the change in labor demand by sector. If you know the share of those sectors by rural versus urban. You could you could kind of calculate the back of the envelope, how much the change like the change that would occur in in Chittenden versus the change that would have to occur otherwise. We don't have that data. Our data is at the state level, um, so we weren't able to dive uh, much deeper um, besides that distributional analysis we, the results we showed. That was the only place where we were really able to look at urban rural. Um, but I think there are ways that you could you could you could try to address that. Um, another way you could look at it is, and this is what we did in the consumer and the household analysis, is one of our impacts is the change in consumer prices as uh, a carbon price is designed to change relative fuel prices. Um, so one thing, that the information we did have was the share of expenditures on energy by different counties. And so we're able to use that, that data to help us look at how the impacts would be, uh, would vary across across the state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so then the, the kind of the last things that uh, we uh, look at, um, we also want to look at the change in household income. How do, how do incomes change uh, when you implement a, a carbon price? And that will have different impacts on kind of labor, capital income, and then this potential rebate income if you chose to, to use the revenues to, to, to rebate to households. Uh, what we define is the change in economic welfare is really going to capture the changes in prices and income on the average household. And so we think of this as kind of our, our best measure of, of costs. And then what we want to do is we want to compare that to a measure of benefits. And so we look at, we kind of do some um, dollar analysis of the, the environmental benefits from reduced emissions to, to do a cost benefit comparison. And then finally, you know, as just addressing here is that the last thing we do is we look at distributional impacts. We're able to look at impacts across different households with different types of income. So we do that by quintiles. So we have five different types of households by income. So we're looking at the average impact on the lowest 20% of the state in terms of income and, and going up towards the, the highest 20% of the state in terms of income. And we'll see much potentially much different impacts across those, uh, those households. We're also, as I mentioned, able to look at how those impacts vary across the counties using the data on how energy expenditures vary across different counties. Um, but we're not able to do a low income by county analysis. We didn't have the data to separate out income within a county. And I would just underscore there that, that we didn't have the data because the data doesn't exist. <laughs> It's not it's sort of a shortfall um, of ours, but we, we really worked quite quite diligently with all of the data sources in the state of Vermont um, 
to, to get the best data we could. And, and it was impressive to see the work that had been done facilitated um, by Efficiency Vermont on the mapping the total energy burden, which is a, a report that was done, I think, in 2016. I'm blanking on the year. But um, but that's what we used their data to look at this, this um, the change per county in energy expenditure and therefore the change in relative costs per, per county, but they don't have this broken out by household income levels, just sort of, again, your average energy expenditure by county, um, which is, again, itself impressive that that much data exists. And then to go to that next level, though, it's just, it's not there. Um, do you guys want to take a couple minutes? Let's hold up on questions. Can you take a couple more minutes and then we'd like to get into it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so just real quick, so what we want to do here is, because all these things I just told you we evaluate, really the bulk of the report is going through different types of carbon price plans and showing how these things differ, these, these, these outcomes change with different carbon price designs. So different policies that have the same sectoral coverage, the same revenue use, the same regional coverage, but differ in terms of the price. So we're trying to do, in each of these sections, section 4.3, we're trying to do an apples to apples comparison where we're holding all the policy options fixed except for the price path. So you can see how the policy changes when you change the price path. Section 4.4, .4, we do the exact same deep dive across all these different impacts, but when you change the revenue use, holding fixed the price. Uh, the next section, uh, 4.5, does the same thing, but looking at whether you cover transportation or transportation heating or transportation heating commercial and industrial or and industrial. So that, that kind of gets us through quite a bit of, of the report because it takes quite a bit of time to for each one to go through all those different um, outcomes. So that brings us to um, section 4.7. In 4.7 we do some case studies of three particular uh, carbon pricing options. Um, the first one is the Essex plan and so uh, we do try to make sure that That's we page 102. Okay. Yeah, and so in 4.7, we're really trying to look at these these three different types of policies, kind of snapshotting in uh, 2025 and 2030, and 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 so it's particularly in the Essex plan, we're trying to make sure that we account for the the hybrid revenue use design, where some of the revenue was allocated to low income or rural households, some revenue was dedicated to reducing electricity rates. Um, so we do uh, incorporate that, um, both those into the analysis there. And then we uh, do a, what we, as I was describing yesterday, uh, a Western Climate Initiative example where um, Vermont's uh, transportation heating emissions are covered by uh, the cap and trade program that includes California and Quebec. And then finally, uh, we do what we call the TCI example, Transportation Climate Initiative. Again, as I was explaining yesterday, uh, this uh, policy proposal is going to be negotiated over the next year uh, between Vermont and the other states that signed on to this uh, memorandum of understanding. And so we don't really know what it's going to look like. And so this is kind of a speculative exercise to say if you had a price somewhere around $20, this is what it would look like. Um, if the price was more towards the Reggie price, so Reggie has allowance price is somewhere around five dollars right now you'd expect that the impacts would be much smaller um, due to the change in the lower price and then finally um, 4.8 is, is is when we we get back to this combining the carbon pricing and non-pricing approaches which we spent quite a bit of time talking about yesterday is um, what type of emissions reductions can you get from combining carbon price and a the non the suite of non-pricing policies that were recommended by the uh, Vermont Climate Action Commission. And then finally, uh, section five is just some other observations. Uh, we talk about, which I mentioned yesterday, uh, the ability for us to, to look at innovation um, and that we don't include this kind of new innovation that would occur through a Vermont policy, although we imagine that in theory that could, that could certainly occur, but we're not able to kind of measure how much that would occur. And then we also uh, talked briefly about how we'd, we'd like to see more analysis of the non-pricing options. It's something that was, that was kind of beyond our, our report. And then uh, we conclude with, with much of the same kind of conclusions we, we concluded the executive summary with. <laughs>
So um, something I, um, I haven't heard you guys talk a lot about in your presentation, and I want to make sure that I'm not either overemphasizing or underemphasizing this issue. Um, and I think a lot of the discussion that goes on around carbon pricing, um, people jumped, and you guys are economists, um, jump to how does this change people's behavior? Uh, are they going to buy uh, less uh, of a certain type of fuel? Are they going to drive less? Um, are they going to turn their thermostat down? Um, as well as kind of the, um, the redistributive context of is this going to affect rural people? Um, is this going to affect um, lower income people? Um, is it going to move um, wealth around in some way? Um, is it going to take wealth out and, and uh, invest that towards certain technologies that are going to further uh, uh, reduce emissions in addition to changing people's behavior? That's kind of what this is all about. Something that really struck me in here, and it's on page five at the bottom, and it talks about the health effects. Um, again, I haven't heard you guys talk a lot about this, but um, you know, you're right, decarbonization will lead to reductions in local criteria air pollutants. Um, and you list some of the um, uh, pollutants, including particulate matter. And then farther down, you say, using estimates on the value of reduced mortality and morbidity from these certain emissions, reductions in these emissions are projected to provide annual benefits of 6.7 billion. Oh, that's a typo. It should be million. Ah. <laughs> I was like, that's great, because we can increase our GDP by 100%. <laughs> okay. Oops. Um, I'm, I'm actually still surprised at that number. Um, that um, I, I think, I, well, I'll speak for myself. I don't read, um, certainly in, in reducing pollutants, there's certainly an advantage to that. And reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and contributing to what's really got to be a national and global effort to reduce. Vermont's not going to solve global warming by what we're doing here. But in contributing to what other states uh, we might work in concert with, um, I think we can have an effect. But looking at you know, some pretty serious um, you know, health consequences, uh, again, you guys aren't probably health experts, you're economists, but um, you know, to the extent that seven to $39 million annually um, from health effects. You know, those are real numbers. Um, can you speak a little bit about some of the work that you've done there and to the, you know, to the extent Vermonters are affected, um, including dying, uh, you know, and, um, with some of the actions that can be taken here? Yeah, um, again, I'm, as you mentioned, I'm an economist, I'm not a health expert. Um, and so what we've done here is, so PM 2.5 is, is a uh, very harmful uh, pollutant. It's, it's, it's so small that it can actually travel into your lungs through your, through your skin. And it, it can cause a lot of problems in your lungs. And so there are a lot of health consequences of that um, in terms of people passing away in mortality or people having um, expensive hospital visits and, and being uh, less healthy, which is morbidity. Um, we take these numbers from the EPA. The EPA in 2018 um, did a, a detailed uh, analysis of, of particulate matter pollution in the United States, and concentrations and emission sources, and then used, um, used values on mortality and morbidity from another study to estimate the dollar value you would get from reducing one ton of that particular emission from 17 different industries. Mm -hmm. And so we're able, we, we just take those numbers and, and apply them. So and those so, numbers really have a national context and are applied to Vermont. So those, um, it's, it's a, it's, it's a na I can't remember if it's the East average or the national average. Okay. Um, I think it's the east average. Um, there's actually higher concentrations of uh, emissions in the east than there are the west. And so the health effects of going from, um, the health effects of increasing or decreasing emissions are, are larger the larger your concentrations are. And so there's larger effects in the east. Um, it's a non-linear relationship. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, again, we just, uh, take those EPA estimates 
Remembering too that those are estimates that are per ton, so it's not applying an aggregate number to Vermont, but it's from this overall research, it's identifying what are those costs per ton of emissions. And we then apply, and that's referred to as an emissions factor, and we apply that emissions factor to Vermont's emissions levels. And, and, the, and what we're estimating when we look at the benefits are the reduced emissions, the emissions that wouldn't ha happen as a result of these policies. Yeah. And I think, again, I'll speak for myself, yeah. I kind of view these as almost, I don't know, um, they're not secondary, they're important, but they're almost uh, second derivative things that, that, that um, come out of changing. I, I think we, as policymakers, focus on the reduction of um, greenhouse gas emissions, that there are economic issues at play there. And certainly when you're talking about carbon pricing, um, you're, you're dealing with dollars and cents. Um, so they're, they're, they're very tangible. Whereas, you know, we think of ourselves as living in a pretty green state. We don't think of air pollution as being a kind of first order issue in Vermont. Um, but again, that's why this struck me, that, that you know, people thinking about reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reducing carbon fuel use is a health issue. Um, that relates to people's quality of life, their health, and people dying, uh, you know, morbidity, as you say here, so, thank you. Well, one way to think of it, too, perhaps, I suppose, and this is somewhat outside of expertise, but more just colloquial understanding, is that even if we don't, even if in Vermont it's not high concentrations of ambient um, air pollutants, to live, I have a diesel vehicle, for example, and to live with that in your life is exposure to pollution on the daily that has, for me, I mean, it's a choice that I'm making personally right now, um, has health consequences. Mm -hmm. And if I were to shift and to not drive a diesel vehicle anymore and drive an electric vehicle, I would no longer be exposed to those emissions. So it's a, it's a way of sort of trying to make it a little bit more grounded in a Vermont context that even if it's not living in the middle of a city where these high concentrations of air pollutants, many Vermonters are still exposed to these pollutants, um, and that does have genuine health impacts. So, is there a direct correlation between PM 1.0 and 2.5 and greenhouse gases? And like, uh, question one. And two, is that higher or lower with some of the, the non-fossil fuel um, heating sources like advanced wood heat that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so, um, the, there's a stronger direct correlation between like sulfur dioxide and, and burning fossil fuels or, or nitrogen oxide. Um, PM, the difference between PM10 and PM2.5 is just the size of the particulate matter. Um, and PM2.5 is the one that has the larger health impacts. PM2.5 comes from a variety of places. Um, driving on dirt roads, and so there's a lot of dirt roads in Vermont that 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 creates partic PM2.5. Uh, pollutants and so we're not able to look at the change in driving on dirt roads as a part of this policy so we don't take that into account here but they're also you know it's a consequence of um, manufacturing as well and so some of these are not are not direct effects of the pricing it's if the pricing slightly reduces and this is what we find if it slightly reduces Say construction, which is another construction dust is another source of PM 2.5. We slightly reduce construction activity, then we're going to slightly reduce PM 2.5 emissions, and that's I mean we we don't find very large, uh, you know, changes in those emissions. Those are actually the ones that were kind of least responsive. Um, so I want to go back to if I could go back to your question about um, people being responsive to prices. Um, you know, we, the model is, uh, has a lot that goes into it, a lot of data, a lot of elasticities that kind of govern how the household in our model changes its behavior relative to, um, to price, uh, to change in prices. We try to be kind of balanced in what those are. We don't want to take the high range or, or the low range. We try to be somewhere in the middle to try to give a, um, a better sense of, what we think is, is maybe it's appropriate to take the middle ground. Um, I would just say that there is, um, I just saw a study, this was on Canadian uh, gasoline taxes. Um, and so 
in, in Canada, including the, the carbon tax in British Columbia and uh, Quebec's cap and trade program, was, is all included in how gasoline taxes have changed in Canadian provinces over time. Um, they found that households were three times more responsive to changes in taxes than they were to changes in prices. So they didn't change their behavior as much in response to prices as they did taxes. And they found that about 60% of the change in uh, driving or change in, in energy use was associated with people buying more fuel efficient cars. About 40% was associated with people just driving less, lower vehicle miles traveled. Um, so that's just one study. Um, there are others out there. There is some evidence that people are, are more responsive uh, to taxes than they are uh, to prices. Um, but I, I say also, I think when you just look out on the road between you know, the last 10 years when we've seen wild fluctuations in gasoline, you, you see that the, the vehicle fleet has, has changed. You saw, you know, I don't think I saw as many F-150s on the road when the price of gasoline was, was $5 a gallon when I lived in California. But as it's fallen, you've seen that those sales have, have continued to go up. And so we do see this behavior over time in just response to the fluctuations in gas. And gases are high, prices are high, people drive less and they drive more fuel efficient vehicles and when it falls, they, they do the opposite. Yeah, so a um, couple of questions, and I want to bounce a couple of ideas off you. Uh, in the um, economic welfare results that you have there, when you showed that, um, say, for the Essex plan on page 103, for the second quintile, um, you have plus 24. So that's people in the 23,000 to 45,000 dollar range. Uh, they would see an economic benefit of about $24 per year. Per, per household. year per household. And then if they're in the rural area, um, you have a minus eight. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you subtract the eight from the 24 or? That's the simplest math you can do. Uh, yeah. That's what I've, I've done is I, I, I say that it seems to be about so, a, you know, an $8 differential between urban and rural. No, uh -huh. No, so there's about an $8 difference between urban and rural, and so then... So during the second quintile, so during the second quintile it to about $16. Yeah, yeah, but again, these are average households, uh -huh. and so okay. it's there is a lot of heterogeneity. Um, I wanted to understand that. Yeah. Um, one of the important things that got out of this was the um, inelasticity uh, for transportation and heating fuels uh, with respect to carbon price. And um, the... The carbon pricing models or proposals that we're looking at here don't go anywhere near enough to change behavior, I think is your point. Um, do, do all these models in, um, assume that, the, that they're revenue neutral or close to revenue neutral? Um, that it would be that whatever revenues are raised would be going back? Yeah, so the carbon pricing only policies we look at are, we are assuming that they're revenue neutral. Okay. We're, we have a, a, there's some page here, we, we talk about very briefly about why we can't uh, look at the direct, um, directly ex expending the money on, on non-pricing um, and, and do an economic analysis of that. So on page 61, we kind of have an explanation of, of of, of what would happen if you just kind of like uh, just a in words what we think would happen if you if you use the revenue to finance green investment mm -hmm. um, I think the point I was trying to make yesterday with um, the trade-offs and the revenue you do use is that yes it's, it's certainly true that you can take those revenues to finance green investment to the extent you do that though you're reducing the revenues you can return to households through rebates or through tax cuts or through electricity rate reductions. Those, those, those ways we know, those revenue neutral ways that we've looked at are ways to um, help offset the, the increased price in electri uh, of energy. Mm -hmm. And so for every dollar you spend, there's an opportunity cost there for green investment. Every dollar you, you spend on green investment, you might get more emissions reductions, but you you, you, you lose the ability to give that money back to households. And so there's a trade-off there. And, and so if, 
And so I think one of our things is saying is that if you are committed to those climate goals, then our modeling suggests you would have to take uh, a hybrid approach because the pricing policy right. wouldn't do it by itself. So um, take looking at the Essex plan uh, that goes from um, $5 per ton the first year up to $40 per ton, ton after eight years. Right? And uh, that's supposed to be revenue neutral. It's supposed to help reduce electric bills. And it's probably not going to change behavior that much because at forty dollars a ton, your people are not going to. And with the with the, the amount of rebates they can get on their electric bill, they're not going to be investing any of that return uh, into anything that will help them reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, like weatherization or buying an electric vehicle or anything like that. So, one of the questions I asked yesterday was, what's the how do, how do prices fluctuate over a year? And as we know, they, they can go up and down 50 cents within a year. Uh, price of gasoline, for instance, and heating oil is the same. So just as a, uh, I don't know whether you can do this on a back of the envelope type of uh, uh, estimate or not, but if we were to take a very minimal carbon price that's well within that range of fluctuation, say 5 to 15 cents uh, per gallon, and take the revenues and use them entirely for programs that would help people weatherize, purchase electric vehicles, things like that, I, in your opinion, based on what you've studied and everything, would that have uh, an effective influence on reducing greenhouse gases so with that without having a major economic impact to, uh, to households because uh, you know when Exxon raises the price 15 cents a gallon uh, which can happen in a week or in a month uh, we don't get anything extra for that whereas if we put a 15 cent per gallon price on carbon um, we can take that money and help people do good things. So um, just if you go to page 107, we have like the changes in economic welfare by household groups. Um, in, in this is for, for 2020. Um, I think we have somewhere around, I have the number for 2025. So 2020, I think the number is somewhere around $50 million of revenue. That's going to equate to... 40 or 50, um, so that's going to equate to, um, top of my head. Uh, I think the nickel a gallon. Uh, so somewhere around, two, so, so the rebate size here is somewhere around $200 per person. Mm -hmm. So this is TCI you're looking at now? Did yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm going to look at TCI. Okay. Yeah, so in 107, just looking at TCI, that's a, that's a, that's a, that, that um, impact in 2025 is about a is 16 cent uh, uh, increase in in gasoline. So where are we looking here? On page one hundred seven. And um, and so that policy is going to raise that the the amount of revenue is going to be about two hundred dollars per person. Those rebate sizes are about two hundred dollars per person per year. Per year, or and then growing over time as the price increases. But so on page one hundred seven, if you just take fifty three dollars for Q one, well, if you don't give them that revenue then you have to subtract that $200. So instead of being $53 to the good, it'd be $150 to the worst. So you could take that revenue and spend it, but you're, you're taking it away from these households who are using that revenue to offset their higher energy prices. So long story short, I mean, just to make sure that's really clear, that it's around $150 cost. One of your questions, right, is mm -hmm. what would that cost be? And, and is it a reasonable cost? Um, if you didn't use the revenue to offset, the cost is about $150, right? I see, okay. um, now, one thing we did not estimate is the basically the, these these same kind of cost benefit analysis per household of taking that revenue and investing it in weatherization. That's a very important caveat. Again, it points to the limitation that we had on our uh, ability to do a detailed analysis of these non-pricing policies. We don't know what that will be. We do think that there will be some benefit. 
to those households of taking that money and investing it in weatherization or investing it in something else that improves energy efficiency because energy efficiency reduces costs. Now, there's a whole lot of literature out there that um, you know, points to the fact that those cost savings may be less than are estimated by engineers um, because of the behavioral response and something called the rebound effect. Um, we think there's some benefit though, right? So I think you shouldn't see it as, as no benefit. We don't know what that benefit would be and it is a good subject for further study. Um, and our understanding is that um, the, the Regulatory Assistance Project, or RAP, is doing some work on these non-pricing policies and that may be published within a month or two. Um, but that's, that's an important consideration. Um, you're also asked, would, would we expect that the investment of those revenues in weatherization or whatever it may be would further reduce emissions? And what we find is that, yes, it would. Right? That seems quite clear. Um, Mike, I'm going to try and squeeze other people in. Okay. Yeah. Since we've got 10 more minutes. So, yeah. Robin, Mark. Sorry, a very short cor cor uh, clarification. You said households and, and persons. Mm. Um, $200 per person or $200 per household? Per household. Per household. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think it's important to know this, this information is, is available somewhere else, but I'm wondering if you know offhand. You're, you're, you did this dividing income into quintiles. You know how those quintiles relate to population percentages. So each one is twenty percent of, of the population. So those, that's how the parameters were set. Mm -hmm. okay. So we, we basically order all the households by income, yeah. take the lowest twenty percent, whatever that cutoff is, they go in bin one. Next twenty percent, they go in bin two. Okay. Um, the. Uh, can I just say something on that briefly, actually, in terms of the revenue use? So therefore, the way we've done this lump sum rebate, which is that rebate in the revenue use calculations, is taking 20% per quintile. So it's taking that whole pie, dividing it by, by five, and then you get 20% in each of, those, each of those slices of the pie, and that gets given to each quintile. And so... The reason why I want to communicate that to you all is that you could have, as some policies do, have a more stylized um, rebate where the rebate is only delivered to certain income levels. If, for example, the concern were to keep whole, so to speak, the lowest two or three income quintiles, in our current framework, if it's the lowest one, that's 20% of your revenue. If it's the lowest two, that's 40% of your revenue. If it's the lowest three, that's 60% of your revenue. You have the remainder to invest in weatherization or whatever else may be a policy priority. Well, what you've done here is simply flat, 20% flat. Of bridge you And it would be less, actually, if you were to aiming at keeping, again, the average household, there's heterogeneity within the quintiles, just as the quintiles represent heterogeneity across the entire population, but within a quintile there's heterogeneity. So if you're just looking at the average household and keeping them whole, let's say in the lowest income quintile, that would be less than what we're currently giving them. Because what we're currently giving them gives them a surplus of about you know between seven and fifty dollars, depending on your um, pricing scenario. Does that make sense? So, yeah. uh, we did one little calculation yesterday that showed that it'd be more like twelve percent of the revenue to keep the lowest income quintile whole, instead of the twenty percent that we're giving them currently, which is giving them a surplus. Right. Now, maybe you want to give them a surplus. These are all your decisions, right? This right. is the public policy decision-making process, but. Just, I think one of the things that's important for us to convey in this is that it can be much more nuanced than it is being represented as here. We, you know, we had to bound our analysis somehow. Um, um, another question is for the purposes, for your purposes, is uh, wood heat and biomass carbon neutral? Yes, right. Yeah. Because we, you know we look at forest products yeah. as a way to stimulate local economy. I'm wondering how that figures in, and also, uh, so carbon neutrality is a different question than particulate matter. Yes. And, uh, and I don't know if you this if if your uh, calculations were based on you know removing carbon fossil fuels out of out of the mix um, and not increasing wood. Emission, particulate emissions. Mm. So just just removing carbon and assuming that whatever replaces that is clean, 
no particular emissions. Is, was that your basis? Mm. Um, so, not quite. Um, we have, uh, it's actually in our model, the, the most distinguished we can get is fuel, oil, and other fuels. And so that is represents heating oil and wood heating. Mm -hmm. And so we can't, and so the emissions factor represents kind of the average emissions for the combined. So we can't, we haven't been able to piece out exactly how much the shift is fuel, oil, and wood. Um, but we do have some emissions factors for, um, for, for wood consumption. And in terms of the PM 2.5, and I think we do see a little uptake in that. Uh, Mark, I asked you this after the presentation yesterday, but uh, I know even the CTC Carbon Tax Center has talked about how it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for an individual state to administer such a carbon tax scheme. Um, do you did you look at the, in this report you know, about uh, the actual administrative costs to, to any of these proposals? Um, no, we did, we didn't look at the the administrative costs. Um, I think there are. There has been research out there on how you can implement these within the existing uh, framework of how the state already taxes entities. So for example, um, adding a, a tax on gasoline, there you already have a gasoline tax. And so you just change the, you can, you can easily implement uh, a change there. Whereas somewhere you didn't already tax in something, it might be more difficult. Um, that's something I don't have at my fingertips now, but it's something that over the next week or so I could um, try to find some of those those reports that show how you would implement, um, administratively implement these programs. Um, I, I'm trying to um, get my uh, get my head around how much additional analysis we would need to do Vermont specific uh, if we wanted to proceed in, 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 any, in any of these options. Yesterday I, I asked a, a question about whether the, you had considered the, um, uh, the cost of um, uh, income eligibility uh, determination if we were going to give a benefit to, to lower income uh, people and that's, that, that's not you hadn't done that, so if we wanted to do that, that would be part of what we would need to consider. And a different level on the sort of uh, benefit side rather than the cost side, um, did you get into things like um, on advanced uh, wood, wood heat, for instance, uh, the, the economic and employment benefits of, of, of uh, promoting a, a Vermont-based um, uh, uh, economic acti activity, or is that something that was outside of, of what you were doing? Um, so I would say that the the model does account for changing in spending money outside Vermont versus spending the money inside Vermont. Um, you know, the the way these models work is every dollar has to go somewhere, and so if it doesn't go out, it can stay in, and that dollar might stay in or might stay out, maybe 50% stays in, depending on how that dollar is spent. Um, so we don't have, I don't have any analysis that would tell you how much of the fossil fuel spending was now kept in state. That's all part of this big contraption that at the end of the day, you can't really tease that out, it's, but it's, it's in there. Um, but I think, I think some more, more research on, on, on those types of things uh, would be great. So my question was sort of following up on Mark and Avram about um, the administrative costs of, of uh, a rebate system. I mean, there would be some cost in setting such a thing up, and you didn't really try to quantify that. That's what I'm getting, right? That's correct. Um, well, then the other questions I was thinking about sort of, again, globally, um, uh, if, if there were, were a carbon tax uh, or carbon pricing, that would affect, actually, not just fuels, but really all the economy, everything, because everything that we consume has, has a carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you consider that as well? Yeah, so um, the way that our, our model works is, is that the kind of the, we call it a social accounting matrix, and, and what it does is it tracks how people spend the money and how it flows through the economy. And so what you see is that for 
we have 18 sectors. We know how much sec each of those sectors is purchasing in fuels versus mm -hmm. purchasing in other goods. And so you'll see, for example, that like the services industry spends a lot more of its revenue or ex expenditures on labor than it does energy. So it's a relatively energy, a non-energy intensive industry, um, whereas the natural gas utility has to purchase the natural gas that is obviously very mm -hmm. energy intensive. And so we do allow for looking, so the model does account for okay. differences in intensity across across different types of industries and goods. Okay. And, and then lastly, just one last follow-up about electrification. Um, as, the, as the economy electrifies, both with electric vehicles and, and heat pumps, um, you know, is, that, is that also built in? Um, sort of an increasing dependence on electricity for, for he heating and transportation. Yeah, the model allows for, for substitution from different types of fuels to electricity. Um, you, you see that especially in the part of the report where we uh, allow for the rebates, the revenues to be used to, to reduce electricity prices. Mm -hmm. You see a, a large increase in, in demand for electricity. Okay, thank you. So we're three minutes over time, um, and we've got another hearing that started three minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> so three hours more questions. <laughs> um, if you want to catch these guys in the hall, it'd be great. We were saying to um, the last group that we spoke with that if you do have follow-up questions, to please send them to Joyce and Catherine. Send the swaps to me or to Joyce. Compile them. Thank you. Thank you.